United States runner Marla Runyon is legally blind. She's legally blind, but, uh, but a world-class runner. She competed in the 2000 Summer Olympic Games in Sydney, Australia. In fact, she qualified for the finals in the 1500-meter race, and she finished eighth in the finals of the Olympics, just three seconds behind the, uh, the medal winners. Now, how does she run being legally blind? Well, she can't see any color at all. And what she does see is she can see a little bit, but it's just like a fuzzy blob out there. So what she does is she follows the blob of runners in the pack as she runs the race. She told TV commentator and Tom Hammonds that the real difficulty was rounding that final turn and racing toward a finish line that I can't see. I just know where it is. And so I run. Well, we Christians are racing toward a finish line we can't see, but we know where it is. Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3 this morning. In that passage, it says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It is a great passage of scripture to exhort and encourage us this morning that we are entered into this marathon called life. And this passage encourages us with the power and the grace of Jesus Christ to run hard all the way to the finish line. So run your race to the finish line. Don't quit. We're to run the race all the way to the end. The word here in in verse 1 means that we must advance by exerting ourselves. It takes effort. It takes work. The word translated race, the Greek word, is an interesting word because we get our English word agony from this. (laughs) Agony. Sometimes life feels like agony, doesn't it? Sometimes the race feels very, very hard. It's a struggle. Run hard anyway. And the emphasis here is on run your race. You can't run my race. I can't run your race. We are to run the race that is set before us. Who sets the race before us? God sets the course of your life. God sets the race that he calls you to run, that he calls me to run. So run your race and run it all the way to the finish line. Don't quit early. Run with perseverance, he says. Run with endurance. Run with fortitude. Run with patience. You may not see the finish line out there, but run hard anyway. You say, well, Dave, that's easy for you to preach. Yeah, it is. It's easy for me to say in words. It's hard to do, though, isn't it? How do we do it? Well, Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3 that gives us three steps we can take to run our races well. Now, if you're looking for something real profound and deep here this morning, you're not going to get it. This is pretty basic. It is pretty simple because that's God's word. And the problem is, is not that we don't know. In fact, the things I'm going to say, you already know. The problem is we don't put it into practice, do we, on a daily basis? So it's good to remind ourselves of what God's Word teaches us. These steps are simple, they are practical, but they are steps for running the race of life. And the first one is lighten your load. Lighten your load. Verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, We do have a great cloud of witnesses. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 are the witnesses. He's just been talking about all of these witnesses who have gone before, all of these men and women of faith who have lived their lives and glorified the Lord through their lives. Yes, they've struggled. Yes, they have flaws, but they trusted God and they ran the race that God set before him, before each one of them. So the witnesses surrounding us as we run our our race are the men and women of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. These men and women are witnesses or testifiers, if you will, of what it means to follow God by faith. And it's not so much that they are 
witnesses of your struggles or my struggles. They are witnesses, they are testifiers who have demonstrated for us their faith in their struggles. So that encourages us as we run our races. The verse does sort of picture, doesn't it? A a host of witnesses like fans in a giant stadium, spectators in a grand stadium who are observing us now as we run our races, and they have all run their races before us. And they are cheering us on in our pursuit of victory in the race of life. They are in heaven encouraging us on earth to run the race by faith as they have done all the way to the finish. So we are surrounded, he says, by this great cloud of testifiers that God will help us run our race to. And so we can run our race by faith. And the first step in running that race, verse 1, he says, given that they are surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. The first step is lighten your load. Simple, basic, practical. Laying aside every weight, we run the race. The Greek word translated encumbrance or weight is a word that means a burden. It referred to something that was very large and bulky and would hinder us from running a race very well at all. The word translated lay aside means to take off or rid oneself of whatever would hinder us in running the race. You know, makes sense. A runner does not load himself up with weight in order to run the race. A runner gets rid of that weight, right? So the runner can run more effectively. Takes off the clothes that would encumber them and gets down to something that would allow them to run very effectively. Takes off the excess weight, gets rid of all of that stuff. And I think we as Christians may need to go on a diet sometimes in order to run our races more effectively. The television program, The Biggest Loser, is all about the people who win by losing the most weight, right? And sometimes I think we as Christians need to go on a spiritual diet, on an activity diet, if you will. We need to lose some of that weight that is hindering us from running our our races. No, we are not competing with one another, right? Like in a human race today in the Olympics. We're not competing with one another. We're encouraging one another to run the race together. And it means that we must lose any weight that would hinder us in that race. I want to say, first of all, that The first step does not refer to sinful activities. That's coming. The next clause refers to sin, and we'll talk about that in a minute. These are not sinful things that we need to get rid of. This step refers to even good things that hinder us from running our race. There are lots and lots of good things in life. Lots and lots of things that are perfectly permissible and acceptable and even wonderful for you and I as Christians. But they can clutter up our lives to the point where we aren't running our race very well for the Lord. That's what he's talking about. We get distracted by all of that. We are busy, but we are busy doing less of what is really important to the Lord that has eternal value. Oh yeah, we're busy. We're busy, 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 busy. And we're worn out sometimes by all that busyness. And yet, when you look at it carefully, very little of it has eternal value. And that's why we need to get rid of that stuff, that clutter in life. In data collected from over 20,000 Christians in 139 countries around this world, most of them in North America, however, between the ages of 15 and 88. That covers most of us here this morning. The Obstacles to Growth Survey taught us some things about spiritual growth. The Obstacles to Growth Survey found that on average, more than 4 in 10 Christians, that's 40% of Christians around the world, say they often or always rush from one task to another. 
And about six in ten Christians say that it's often or always true that, quote, busyness of life gets in the way of developing my relationship with God. That's 60% of Christians say the busyness of life gets in the way of my walk with God, 60%. The Christians most likely to agree with the fact that busyness gets in the way of life, we're from where? North America. <laughs> Us. As well as Africa and Europe. While busyness afflicts both men and women, the distraction from God was more likely to affect men than women in every surveyed continent except North America, where women have more of a problem with the busyness of life than men, although not by much. 62% of women and 61% of men reported busyness as interfering with their relationship with God. By profession, here's an interesting one, by profession, the profession that had the highest percentage of busyness that damages their relationship with God, what do you think it is? Yeah, it's pastors. Isn't that great? 54% of pastors said it adversely affects their relationship with... uh, No, 54% say they rush from task to task. 65% of pastors said it affects their relationship with God. That's sad. It's tragic and ironic... The very people who could best help us escape the bondage of busyness are themselves in chains, said Dr. Michael Zigarelli, who conducted the study of the Charleston Southern University School of Business. Secular agency, finding pastors affected by the disease of busyness. We've got to lose some weight if we're going to serve the Lord effectively. Most of us Christians need to go on a diet. We need to look, and that includes pastors. We need to look at our lives analytically, cut back on the activities, responsibilities, hobbies, possessions that become weights or hindrances to running the race of life. One of the most important spiritual disciplines we can learn is the discipline of saying no. Even good things. The television, uh, the, uh, the things that impact our lives, that, that tie us up, that distract us. What are those kinds of things? Well, homes, cars, boats, possessions in general, if you want to put it that way. Some of us gather so many possessions that they become a hindrance to our spiritual lives. Some of the most spiritual decisions that we have to make are the choices of what we will buy. Why? Because those things can come to possess us. Even if we can afford it, even if it's perfectly okay, they take us away from running the race God has set before us. They have to be maintained. They have to be managed. They have to be used. They have to be whatever, right? Debt is a huge burden that affects many, many Christians who get so in debt that they now no longer can effectively step out and serve the Lord by faith. Because the burden of debt is hovering over us to distract us. Even good things like responsibilities in church, ministries, family, friends, responsibilities like that can distract us. And take us away from following the Lord. They're not sinful. None of these things are bad in themselves. But they are burdens. They are responsibilities. They are things that take us away from running the race of life. So, the first step in running an effective race is lighten the load. Secondly, and avoid ensnaring sin. Avoid ensnaring sin. The same verb encompasses the second one. Lay aside the sin which so easily entangles us. 
We're to lay aside the sin that entangles us. So now we are talking about sinful things that affect our lives. Many, of course, distractions hinder us in our spiritual lives, but they're not sinful distractions. Sinful distractions, however, can get such a grip on our lives that they destroy us, they damage us, and we cannot run the race of life effectively that God sets before us. If if we want to run the race well, we must avoid the sins that become fatal distractions because certain kinds of sins are addictive. They are entangling. They are ensnaring kinds of sins. These kinds of sins get such a grip on our lives that they stop us cold. They end our ministries. They can even hold up a church or affect the church from doing its ministry and making a pro- making progress in the in the race of life. Churches fracture over sin. People's lives are damaged by sin in the fellowship. That ripple effect can be very damaging. These kinds of sins are fatal distractions in the race of life. Avoid them. Stay away from them, the author tells us. Perhaps you've heard this common myth expressed by Christians, all sins are equal. Is that true? No, it isn't true. All sins are equal, people say. Simply not true. The Bible clearly differentiates between some sins in terms of their effect on our lives and the lives of others. The truth is that all sins make us equally liable before a holy God. Even one sin makes us liable before a a holy God. But some sins are far more damaging than other sins to ourselves and to others. For example, some sins are called what we might call sins of consequence. Some sins have greater consequences than other sins, both in the examples we see in the Bible and the realities we observe in our lives. Now, I understand that all sins have consequences, all right? I'm not saying that sin doesn't have consequences, but I understand all sins have consequences, but some sins have much greater consequences than others. And so we call them sins of consequence. For example, if I covet my neighbor's boat, I sin, right? Covetousness is sin. But if I steal my neighbor's boat, I've committed a sin of consequence. Why? I'd go to jail. There's a human consequence. I don't go to jail if I just covet my neighbor's boat, but I still sin. So that's the difference we're talking about. Another category of sin is the one we have in this verse called ensnaring sin or entangling sin. (coughs) Today, in our language today, we'd call it an addiction. Addictive sin. There are some sins that grab us in a way that addicts us to continuing the sinful behavior, both, and that, and so that then ruins both our lives and the lives of others. Sexual sin is one of these kinds of ensnaring sins. Paul, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 6, warns us about anything that it, you affects our bodies. You know, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, he says. And particularly sexual immorality, he says. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral man sins against his own body. It affects the physical, emotional, chemical makeup of a person. And the context of his point is that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Sexual immorality becomes addictive or ensnaring sin. And there are, of course, all kinds of other sins like that that ensnare us or addict us. So that it turns our bodies against us and our bodies crave or desire something so powerfully because the sin has turned our own bodies against us. It's addictive or ensnaring. We can't escape that craving. Substance abuse. I mean, that's the obvious one people talk about today of all kinds of substances. But there are other kinds of ensnaring sins, sins of the mind. 
that addict the mind so powerfully that we can't can't get rid of it. It just it, it's a craving. It's a it's a desire that takes over us, and it's an ensnaring sin. The one thing that ensnaring sins have in common is that they grab us so powerfully we cannot escape the addiction. These ensnaring sins stop us in our tracks. They become fatal distractions that destroy our lives and the lives of other people. Now, I say that these kinds of ensnaring sins are things that we cannot escape. When I say that, of course, I'm leaving out something, aren't I? I'm leaving out the power of God. We can't escape them ourselves, but in the power of God, we can escape these kinds of ensnaring sins. And that's the wonder of following Christ. We can escape by the power of God, but even so, the escape is sometimes very difficult, very hard, and time-consuming process. And there are ministries. We support a ministry like His Mansion, for example, which specializes in helping people who are caught up in ensnaring sin because there's a process by the power and the grace of God to break that pattern and gain victory over that ensnaring sin. Praise God, it happens. That's the great joy. But the truth is that we would be better off avoiding the ensnaring sin in the first place, right? Stay away from it because it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult for you to gain victory. So stay away from ensnaring sin that will derail your life, your service for the Lord. So first of all, principle number one, lighten your load. Number two, Avoid ensnaring sin, and three, focus on Jesus. I told you, it's pretty basic stuff. (laughs) Pretty basic stuff. Now, he spends most of the time, verses 2 and 3, on this third one. Because this is the primary tool, if if you will, that we have for running the race well, or the primary methodology that we have for running our race well. Let's look at it, verses 2 and 3. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Replacement therapy. That's what we're talking about here. You see, if all you do in life is say no, just say no, denial to those sins and those activities and those things, you're going to have a hard time winning the victory. Why? Because there's nothing left in life. You're just saying no. So you have to replace what you're saying no to with something that you say yes to. And the yes replaces the no. And that is vital for winning the victory. You have to replace the no with a yes. And what do you say yes to? You say yes to the things that focus on Jesus Christ. And when you fill your life with those things, then... You can continue to say no to the things that take you away from Jesus. But if all you do is say no, and you never replace it with anything that focuses around Jesus Christ and service to Him, then you're just going to fall back into the same pattern again. You have to replace it. And we replace it with a renewed focus, a daily focus, on Jesus Christ and the things that honor Christ in our lives. Focus on Jesus, because He will lead you to the finish line. Last spring, we went up to Bates College to watch our daughter Katie swim in a Special Olympics event. 
and uh, one member of her team was legally blind. Someone helped her get into the water in her lane, got her set up, got her pointed in the right direction. And then when the start signal went off, this legally blind young lady swam her race, and she swam straight as an arrow all the way down to the end. But she couldn't see the finish line. How did she do it? Well, for one thing, she had a coach who was walking along the side and calling out directions and calling out encouragement and all of that. And so she had to turn away from every other sound, and boy, that place was loud, and focus on the instructions and swim her race all the way to the end. Well, guess what? It's the same principle in our spiritual lives. We have to turn away from, in this case it's fixing our eyes on Jesus, by turning away from everything else. The verb means to focus our attention so exclusively on Jesus Christ that everything else in life pales in comparison. We turn away from all other things in life that would distract us from following Christ. Because as we follow Christ, he leads us to the finish line that we cannot see in life. He leads us there, so we focus on Jesus. First of all, he says, as our founder and finisher. Jesus is the founder or author of our faith. He is the finisher or completer of our faith. He is the architect who designed our faith. And he is the carpenter who constructs it. So when we focus our attention on Jesus as the center of our lives, we are focusing on the one who founded our faith and the one who completes it in us by his grace and power. Now, when we focus on Jesus as the founder and finish of our, of our faith, we see the one, he says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Did Jesus look at the cross or the joy? He looked at the joy. He looked at the eternal result. And as he looked at the eternal result, he could endure the cross. So it's the same pattern. We focus on Jesus and the eternal result to endure the struggle. We don't focus on the struggle. When do you have your most trouble in life? It's when you're focusing on all the problems, right? Whoa, man, I can't handle this. This is so bad. We get our eyes off that, we get our eyes on Jesus and the eternal result. And for the joy that is set before us, we can endure whatever comes now. Because that's where our focus is. In fact, that allowed Jesus, it says in this verse, to disregard the shame that he faced on the cross. And this was the most shameful thing they could do to a person. It was reserved for the worst of criminals. But he could, he could disregard it. The word means he could actually despise the despising. <laughs> he could treat the shame as if it was of no importance at all. He could disregard it because he was focused on the joy that was set before him. And when it was all over, Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. His work was done. He sat down. Now, you know in Hebrews that that's a, an important theme, right? that Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, meaning his work is done. And if his work is done, now he, can, he lives to make intercession for you and me. And his power is used to help us get to where he is, the end, the finish line. His work is done. He can lead us there to the finish line. We can follow his example in life. We don't focus on our problems. We focus on Him and our eternal life in heaven. And the reality is that when we get our lives, or our eyes, if you will, off Jesus, we get our lives messed up, don't we? That's when things fall apart. And He is the one who can lead us to the finish line. A businesswoman by the name of Marion Leotaud wrote that nearly seven years ago, 
She said, I started a business. I prayed diligently about the decision and sensed God's confirmation to move forward. Because of my inexperience in retail operations, I depended heavily on God for wisdom and direction. Between the first time I caught a vision for this venture and the day we opened our doors, I prayed every step of the way. On opening day, customers lined up around the building. With a pounding heart and sweaty palms, I became acutely aware of the fact that the success or failure of this business rested on me. Oops. I relied on my own understanding. For the next four years, I ran the store as if that was true. Everything depended on me. I simply was too busy and preoccupied to spend any time reading the Bible or praying. Daily preoccupation over my work took the place of daily quiet time with God. I didn't even trust the counsel of my advisors. My husband, Dan, she says, was a primary owner of the business, but I wouldn't listen to him either. Then she says, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. She says, I discovered how true that those words were. The longer I skimped in my spiritual life, the further I fell from the vine, the further I fell from the vine, the more all my efforts proved fruitless, making decisions apart from God. And Dan started to have a snowball effect that eventually led to the complete demise of our business and nearly destroyed our marriage. Looking back on those four years, I know now what was at play. Apart from Christ, I could do nothing. Instead of remaining in Jesus as he instructs us to do in John 15, 5, I ran on ahead without him. Ever have that kind of an experience? You know, you pray and you pray and you pray and you're going through all of the wisdom process and you're making your decisions and then it starts to go and now it's all on me. Right? Wrong. We get our eyes and our focus off Jesus Christ and onto ourselves, and everything starts to fall apart. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the founder and finisher of our faith. Secondly, we focus our eyes on Jesus as our ultimate example. Verse 3. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that Why do you look at Jesus? So you won't grow weary and lose heart. Now, verse 3 is a command in the Greek language. This is not an option for Christians. This is a command. We are commanded to give careful attention to Jesus. The word means to reason with deliberation about Him and His life. He is our perfect example. Think about Him. Consider Him. He stood his ground against all those who were attacking him. All the hostility, all the things that this world could throw against Jesus Christ did not stop him from finishing the work of God that had been set before him. And so we are to pay careful attention to his example so that we don't become weary, so that we don't become discouraged in life. Giving up our souls, literally, is what it says. Giving up our souls is what happens when life deals us so many blows and so many struggles that we feel like we can't keep going anymore and we give up our souls. We quit. We stop running the race. It just isn't worth it anymore. And it happens over and over again. Over the years, I've seen so many people who just end up giving up, quitting the race. Sad. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus went all the way. And we can be faithful and persevere by keeping our eyes on Him. If we keep focused on Jesus Christ, then we won't quit when the going gets tough. One of my favorite historical characters, at least in the pastoral world, is a man by the name of Charles Simeon. Even before finishing his degree and still lacking pastoral experience, Charles Simeon, with no experience whatsoever, was appointed to the pastorate of Cambridge's Holy Trinity Church in England. Now, that was back in the days when the Anglican Church 
appointed people to the pastorate. So he was appointed to this church, and the church was very much less than pleased with the pastor. They didn't like him at all, as a matter of fact. Opponents harassed Simeon by locking the family pews so that nobody could come into church and sit there. So they'd lock up their section of the church. And then they wouldn't come, of course. But they paid for that. (laughs) So when Simeon brought in benches, church council members tossed them out into the churchyard. The church board tossed them out. Because Simeon was insistent on preaching the truth of God's word and the call of God on people's lives to show their their faith by, by how they live and to be real and to follow the Lord fully and com- with a committed heart. They tossed all the benches out into the courtyard so that people had to stand to come to church there. But that didn't stop him. He kept preaching. For 54 years he pastored that church. 54 years. Now, it got a whole lot better. (laughs) That'd be tough for 54 years. No, it got a lot better, and the church got solidly found, never grew to be a huge church or anything, but solidly grounded. And he taught faithfully the Word of God for 54 years in that church. He also, at the same time, began to hold informal seminars for pastoral students from Cambridge University. In 1812, He instituted weekly conversation parties in his rooms for theological discussion. By 1823, some 40 students were attending regularly. By 1827, the number was closer to 60. Uh, Of the students, Simeon trained during his 54 years at Holy Trinity Church. Some 1,100, 1,100 became distinguished pastors missionaries, and chaplains in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's perseverance. That's faithfulness. Now how do you do that kind of thing? I read his story and I say, God, whoa, how do you do that for 54 years faithful like that? You do it by focusing on Jesus, not the problems, not the people even, but Jesus Christ. And it's the same for you. Some of you have demonstrated wonderful perseverance in following the Lord Jesus Christ over the years. Probably 50, 60 years. And that's the only way you can do it either, is by focusing on Jesus as the author and finisher of your faith and as your ultimate example to run the race that God sets before you in life. Unfortunately, we often get distracted, discouraged in life. We need to make changes that get us back focused on the Lord. Revive us again, we just sang this morning, right? Bring us back to the basics, God, where we are focused on you and following you. And so we can run the race he sets before us. Former NFL and Seattle Seahawks head coach Mike Holmgren looks back to a heartbreaking moment in his life when he as a player was cut by the New York Jets. He was a backup quarterback for uh, Joe Namath, and he was cut by the New York Jets. And he says that when he was 11 years old, he made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. He accepted Christ as his personal Savior. But as he pursued his dream of being a, a football He turned away from all that God had in his life. All those things he'd learned in Sunday school and church growing up, he turned away from it all. But when he was cut by the New York Jets, he said, all of that changed. I pulled my Bible out, my dusty Bible, he mentions, and found comfort in a verse I had memorized in Sunday school. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, Lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Basic, simple, the only way to live. Come back to the Lord and focus on those basic principles in life. And he said, I asked Jesus Christ that, that day, 
I asked Jesus Christ to take control again. My priorities in life, he says, are faith, family, and football in that order from that day forward. And God has used him. So are you ready to make the changes in life that will help you run your race effectively for him? We need to come back to that regularly, don't we? Here's some diagnostic questions we can all ask ourselves today. Is sin strangling my spiritual vitality? Is there some sin in my life that's got a grip on me that I need to repent from and turn away from? What clutter can I eliminate from my life? Am I just distracted by lots of stuff? What's the clutter? Am I doing many things poorly instead of a few things well? Am I proving that Christ is first in my life? You know, we can say that all we want, but am I proving that Christ is first in my life by how I spend my time, energy, and money? What three things can I do now that have eternal value? Good questions for all of us to ask ourselves as we run the race that God has set before us. Father, teach us. Teach us to follow you, Lord Jesus, and where you are leading and what you want us to do. And teach us the disciplines that are necessary to run our race well that will honor you with how we use our time and our energy how we focus upon you and turn away from all the stuff, both good and sinful, that would derail our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.